Professor Howard Williams takes you on a journey through time and space, exploring death and memory, past and present. Archeodeath. Welcome to the launch of the What's What's Dyke Wrexham Comic Heritage Trail. Now, this is a new initiative in digital public archaeology using comic panels, 10 in total, and a map showing you where you can access the locations depicted in each of the panels to bring Britain's third longest ancient monument to life. What we hope to do is by telling you something of the story of the monument's construction, its location, its landscape context and its afterlife, how it's used and reused in later centuries, we can bring local people and visitors a new sense of this monument that only survives in a very damaged way, um, often in fragments, destroyed by later development and building. So in many places it lies hidden. In plain sight, sometimes it's hidden completely. In other places, it's prominent, and yet people don't know what they're looking at and that it's even there. And but this is particularly true in North Wales's largest town, where Wattsdyke runs around the edges of the western sides of the suburbs and heads off to the north, um, uh, up the Allen Valley, and to the south through the Erddig Estate and then south to onwards to Ruabon and Oswestry. Now, Wattsdyke is 63 kilometres long in total and Wrexham is only one of the areas where it's, uh, you, can, you can visit it. So we hope that this heritage comic trail, this, tr this, this, this new way of engaging digitally with the monument, is a case study, is an opening sort of salvo of potentially other projects where we can use comics and we can explain um, people's local heritage. So I hope you enjoy our videos. We go from the north um, of Wrexham to the south of Wrexham and we ident go to each of the 10 locations um, where we depict in the comic and we explain our choices of why we created it the way we did. And so uh, by the end of it, you'll get a sense of the comic and hopefully a sense of the kinds of locations where you can visit the, 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 um, the comic panel locations. Um, in addition to that, I should say there's academic rationale for this that we've published in a series of lo um, articles. In the 2019 book, Public Archaeology Arts of Engagement, John Swagger uh, has published a sort of rationale for his um, comic work um, in, in public archaeology and heritage. In the Digital Open Access Academic Journal, the Offers Dyke Journal, Volume 1 for 2019, John Swagger again um, looks at the rationale for comics um, as a mode, mode of public engagement and specifically focuses on um, the, the, their importance for looking at borderland monuments, such as linear earthworks, looking at his Oswestry Heritage Comics as a case study. And in the 2020 book, Public Archaeology's of Frontiers and Borderlands, uh, John and myself do a sort of rationale for our, um, our comic heritage trail by going through the challenges we, we were facing and our early ideas and thinking, building on another paper I've written in here that, that actually outlines the problems of interpreting what's like in particular. So um, all of these are open access for you to download and we'll put links in the descriptors. And I hope you enjoyed the rest of the videos that take you on the journey to the locations that we depicted in the comics and the kind of choices we made about how to interpret this enigmatic ancient monument of the early Middle Ages. Okay, welcome to our locations one and two for the comic. Now, over that hill there, over that slight rise, Wattsdyke drops down to the River Allen and then rises up on the other side and incorporates the ramparts of Bryn Allen Iron Age Hill Fort. And our first image was attempting to capture what you can't see of how the, this linear earthwork of early medieval date would have followed the Allen River's eastern top of its escarpment um, so using the river as its uh, defensive barrier to the north and then when it comes up this side um, it's uh, departing from the river and heading over reasonably flat ground and then rising up um, towards Garden Village. So um, John why did we choose to do that first uh, image uh, the way we did? I think I wanted to show where the dike was coming from so you got this idea that it was coming towards Wrexham from this 
further north, for the most northern extent, across the hill fort, across the river, and then to the, as it were, the reconstructed bit that we drew uh, for that first one. And that's one of the images where we, we wanted to show how it may have looked in the early Middle Ages. Obviously, we had to make lots of informed guesses about the construction because the bank and ditch are all that survives of a perhaps a much more complex monument. But we, you know, we had to make some guesses about watchtowers watch and, towers, yeah. you know, um, uh, but, um, we had a sort of paths behind. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We even put some sort of some locals, some Welsh people, sort of looking. How do I get my cattle across here? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So there's that that aspect too. Yeah. Yeah, but in a way not dissimilar from the landscape that you see immediately around this bank. So, you know, it's grassed over, it's it's not kind of scorched earth, but the trees are kept back. So in a way, although you can't see this at the first location, you can kind of see it when you come to this one. You can almost imagine the reconstruction sitting here on this preserved bit of bank. So that first uh, image was very much about showing the monument as it may have been in the early Middle Ages, how it would have been controlling and dominating the landscape. The second image is um, here, where people walk their dogs and use this as a place to, um, you know, of recreation. It's also there's horses in the fields usually, not today, and um, it, it's it's a public footpath. So, what was the rationale of showing this bit, John? I think to kind of make sense of what you can see here. I mean, for for us, it's fairly clear that this is something. If you don't know that it's an early medieval monument, we at least know that it's something. But for a lot of people, they wouldn't even necessarily know that it is anything. Yeah. And so showing that it's part of something that they can't see up there, that's broken here, that extends off in that direction, I think that was kind of, that was what I wanted to show here. And we've got the, um, we've got the houses, we've got the, the railway line, Pandy, the Bluebell Estate, uh, the Bluebell Lane, and we've got the field. So it's really accessible for people to come and see bits of the ancient monument and there's back the bank and the very shallow ditch here but then there's other sections where it's broken through by a farm gateway so there's it's not surviving so you get a sense of how it's a bit of a mishmash it's heavily damaged but it survives in part and people being very polite and staying away but there are in fact walkers with dogs over here as well which is exactly what we wanted to show in the comic you know how this place is used today absolutely And we're not far from where we were for uh, filming before, uh, but when we're on the bank of Wattstyke and you're looking to the south and the ditch drops off you know, dramatically on that western side. So the bank is here about three metres above the ditch. And this may be not far from its original height. Maybe it was originally another metre up here with a steep slope down, a deep ditch up to three metres deep in itself. Um, now it's only about one metre and then the, maybe there would have been a palisade on top of the, the bank making it a really formidable monument to explain the intersection of the dike where it's broken by the A483 uh, road which runs from well all the way through Wales but he is heading northwards here to Chester or southwards um, to Oswestry Street and on to Welshpool and, and further south. We're on a really important modern routeway that would have been also an important ancient thoroughfare that's been blocked by the line of what started controlling the landscape again. John, what's, yeah, and, what do you... And then of course from, from a visual point of view, what's really interesting here is you have this extremely well preserved section of the dike that just gets cut off completely by mm. the modern road. And that's that's a really, a really kind of powerful uh, thread that we then follow through the rest of the comic is the way in which the dike as it runs through Wrexham constantly is being cut, is being interfered with, is being lost and so the comic is an attempt to kind of show not only where that happens but then to thread those pieces together visually so you can make sense of the monument as it moves through Wrexham. Yeah and even if you're local you may not really appreciate that this section of Bank and Ditch is comparable or related to the bits, uh, uh, you know, only a hundred meters or so to the north, and the bits over the 483, which takes you a good five minute drive or a 15 minute walk to loop around to actually access. They feel completely disconnected from each other. And it's interesting, the walkers that we just saw before had heard of Watts Dyke, but it would be interesting to know whether they knew that this was the same as that, and whether the bit in the cemetery was the same as that, or yeah. whether in, in their minds it is separate monuments. And that's one of the things the comic is obviously trying to address, yeah. is to kind of stitch all these things back together. 
So having come from uh, the Wilderness Wood, uh, uh, where it drops down to the Allen, uh, across the fields at Pandy, right up to the 483, our next uh, spot to visit is going to be over by Watts Dyke Primary School. But how many people know that Watts Dyke Primary School is sitting on a monument called Watts Dyke? Wrexham and this uh, tarmac lump is the bank of Watts Dyke. You're looking northwards there where Watts Dyke runs as a, a very damaged monument under the line of fences of back gardens of properties that uh, um, run onto Buckingham Road. Down this alley you can actually walk down the bank and this slope here is the surviving earthwork of the early medieval dyke. So this was another point where we decided to do a comic panel. And I, I just particularly like the image of the uh, bank here preserved under the tarmac. I just thought it was a great, not only a great way of showing how much of the bank survives, but also showing that it's still used, that people still travel up and down the bank. We've got somebody coming with a dog here just to demonstrate that people do still use this every day. Oh, and the fact that it's accessible. The yes. fact that because there's the tarmac here, it actually makes it accessible. Um, that, that was actually quite important as well because a lot of the dike fragments aren't that accessible, yeah. they aren't that easy to get to. What's so, on what side? <laughs> so this is Crispin Lane and this was the next panel in the comic that we did and as what's like passes through Wrexham here it's quite chopped up, it's quite chopped by the railway, by the road, by buildings, by new development and so it was a bit of a challenge figuring out exactly how to show all these different bits. So in the end, we actually went for quite a high aerial perspective that showed the dike coming in alongside the railway line, alongside Crispin Lane, and then over towards the Premier Inn on the other side of the main road. Because the alternative was to do a shot more or less from here, showing where Howard is on the dike itself, showing that bit of the dike and then the road and, and so on. But we weren't, we weren't really quite sure that that would show enough or show the dike in any meaningful sort of way for people to identify it, particularly because it's this whole stretch uh, where the dike is so invisible, not just this one bit. We're in Wrexham Cemetery and this is actually a really striking location to come and see surviving remains of the early medieval linear earthwork Watts Dyke. Um, behind us the line of Watts Dyke survives as a huge bank covered by Victorian graves and this is the western boundary of the medieval and early modern township of Wrexham but it also was the western boundary of the Victorian cemetery. In other words all of this um, eastern side was populated by Victorian graves and then they extended the cemetery in the Edwardian era and into the 1920s, 30s um, with the addition and the extension of the cemetery um, through the 20th century. And so although the heritage of this site is all about the history of the cemetery, what Dyke is on the map as you enter the cemetery and you can see the bank surviving. Now the ditch is all gone and it's now a path with uh, graves uh, on either side. But at least in this location, you have it not only as a major monument, but they've also marked it on the sign, and uh, as where the Victorian pathways cross the line of Watts Dyke, they've marked out in um, English and Welsh um, its line. So actually, not only is this a place where Watts Dyke is well preserved, but it's one of the few places where there's been heritage interpretation of the monument, which is another reason why we did a comic here. So, John, tell us about it. Yeah, so um, the, point, the, the point of view of the comic is more or less as you see here, looking at the dike from this angle. And one of the reasons um, I, I chose this point of view was to try and get, a, try and sort of draw a good impression of 
the way that the monuments and graves are placed into, not just on, but into the dike itself, sort of cut into the side of it, sitting on the top, and so on. And so the focus for the comic is a burial taking place in this uh, grave here, um, which happens to be the resting place of Henry Dennis, who is probably best known as the manufacturer of Raven Red Brick. Um, and so there's another connection here. Um, this part of the cemetery is where a lot of the the good and the great of Victorian Wrexham were buried, and it's just nice to have those two important pieces of Wrexham's heritage right up on top of each other here. And also there's another um, indirect link to the Middle Ages, because of course Victorian graves had many Gothic, mm. but also wheel-headed crosses inspired by early medieval monuments. So here we have some graves, there's not a number of them actually going down this stretch, not only uh, that later medieval neo-Gothic style, but actually inspired by monuments of the Irish Sea region, including those that you can see at Neston Church, Bromborough Church, and in St John's Priory in Chester. So I I'm not saying that's a conscious decision, but there's an interesting juxtaposition of Victorian monuments inspired by early medieval you know, um, art, and actually embedded into, planted on, a real early medieval monument. This one's kind of interesting because it's almost self-consciously primitive as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's trying to look earlier than some of the ones you have down there, which are much more fancy. Yeah. And whether it's intentional or not, the, the bank of Watstein is doing a, a, a Victorian landscape garden cemetery role of providing that perspective, that framing of the graves. It's giving a topography to the graves, and they, they also were um, utilising quarries, but this, this provided a natural boundary and a, and a sort of a landscape feature. So whether by design or a happenstance, there is a sort of interplay here between uh, Victorian cemetery design and an early medieval monument. And it's nice to show an early medieval monument in a period that isn't the early, Medi uh, isn't the early Middle Ages. So yeah. It's nice to show how these monuments were used and how they kind of echo through the town's history from the past all the way up to the present day. Yes, because we don't really know for how long what style was used for and whether it was ever effectively used in the manner it was it was designed to be used. Um, and in many ways, these monuments pass out of memory. They, they disappear uh, into the landscape. And yet, it's quite clear at a local scale, they were never really forgotten. And whether people were scratching their chins and going, mm, I wonder if that's what style, like we would as perhaps archaeologists or not, um, they certainly were sort of echoing through, as John says, local um, society and local sort of social memory as, as, as key features of the local landscape. And function. I mean, what's, I mean, they chose this, they chose to use Watsdyke because it was a convenient boundary. It's a boundary. I mean, they could have had the cemetery extend another five feet, but there wasn't a convenient early medieval yeah. bank there. So they, they picked this because it was functionally, um, it was useful to them. So it may not have been rationally thought out of, aha, we're going to reuse Watsdyke because that has an ancient uh, aura of power or significance or spirituality or anything. It's just that they, uh, it, it's a part of the natural landscape or the local landscape that they're utilising. Okay, here we are at Court Wood um, in the Irvig National Trust managed estate of Irvig Park and we have again houses whose back gardens run up onto the top of Watts Dyke. Then we have a very well preserved bank and because we're on a steep slope the ditch has all been filled in and it, the slope would have been cleared right the way down to the Clywedog River. And at this location Watts Dyke is following the top of the scarp um, dominating tra traffic, humans and animals moving up and down the river uh, from east to west, as well as, of course, controlling its standard north-south uh, route. So this is a really great location on the Earth Estate where Watstike is a well-preserved monument, but many people don't know it's here, covered in, covered in trees and bracken, ferns and uh, massive nettles. So what do we do here then, John? 
Um, I, I think the, when you brought me here the first time to have a look at the site, one of the things that really struck me was, of course, the, the, the escarpment that runs all the way down to the river. And, of course, it's covered with trees now, and it's impossible to see the dike from the river down there. But if you imagine, as you say, in the early medieval period, all those trees gone, the view that you would get of the dike or of the defences around the dike or of the sort of activity around the dike would have been really not just impressive but intimidating as well for anybody coming from the west. And that was one of the things I wanted to try and catch in that image was that sense of being intimidated not just by the monument but also by the natural landscape as well. So here we took it back to the early Middle Ages and imagined, as we did in our first image of, of, uh, of the Allen Valley, imagined this landscape being controlled not only by the bank and ditch but potentially a palisade on top watchtowers and warriors not only not huddled behind the the monument but out there in the landscape you know uh, approaching challenging people coming down the valley you know, whether they're in peacetime and they're trying to trade animals and goods or it's in wartime and there may be potential raiders we see this potential of the bank and ditch to be part of a broader landscape of control um, yeah, and then that was that was really interesting too, having the figures so far in front of the frontier, you know, so that they're actually part, as you say, of a landscape of control rather than just a point of control along the ridge here. I think it was it was really important to have that as part of the comic. And important as well because so many people think that Wattstock would have been a border line, like a modern territorial right. boundary between land ownership. And we don't think that early medieval kingdoms worked in that way had territorial control in that same fashion and indeed these linear monuments are about controlling the landscape to their east as well as to their west and therefore about blocking up and managing the broader landscape not about defending a specific strategic line for territorial or military functions mm. yeah and so that, that's why again it's important to have people in these things so that you can actually see what the relationship and the interaction were between different kinds of people around this borderland area, not just a bunch of soldiers behind a wall protecting it from, you know, some imagined foe. So here at um, Erdig Castle, Norman Martin Bailey, I'm standing in the ditch of Watts Dyke and it runs behind me here and then gets cut by and intersects with the, the massive ditch that runs around the Norman Bailey and then the marshes beyond. And I think this is a really interesting example of how sometimes an, an extraordinarily impressive set of features like this can actually be very difficult to draw because you have to make a decision about what you're going to show and what you're not going to show because you can't put everything in. And so we focused on the way that the Norman Martin Bailey overlooks the Valley of the Cluedog, and then looks north towards Watts Dyke as it runs up there, but also the way in which it used Watts Dyke as part of the defences, even though part of me wants to just draw this massive ditch. Um, but yeah, so, so this is really a place where you've got several different periods, di di monuments from different time periods intersecting and interacting, and that was one of the things we wanted to make sure we, we showed in the comics panel. So Watts Dyke survives well in Big Wood, but the Erdig estate didn't want it in front of their main house. So that gave us an opportunity to discuss the active destruction of the monument in various places through time, from the Middle Ages through to the modern era. Yeah, uh, here was really an opportunity to show the monument being removed, which is not a part of the story that most people want to tell. Um, so we did, we focused in this panel on the monument being, or the Watts Dyke being removed as they redid the gardens, um, which again is a kind of an interesting thing. So not being removed for a big impressive engineering work like a railway or a factory, but being removed for landscaping, um, which is, uh, yeah, not, not, a, not the sort of story you often hear told about archeological monuments. So we're on a very well-preserved section of Watts Dyke on the Erdig estate, where Watts Dyke faces west over the Black Brook, which is a stream that goes uh, northwards to join the Clywedog at the site that becomes Erdig Castle. And this is a site which where we have good photographs of Sir Cyril Fox doing his re survey recording of the monument in the 1930s 
And just to the north of us, Cluid Powys Archaeological Trust have recently been doing excavations. Not on a section that's well preserved, but a section where the dike has long been landscaped away. So um, this is a really cool location. Um, not that many people on the Irvig walks uh, around the estate will know this is Watts Dyke. And you've got the bank here, a massive ditch that's preserved. And remember, this would have been another human body height depth, uh, originally deep, about three meter deep ditch. And then rising up to a counter scarp part of the natural landscape before dropping off down to the lowlands and to the stream. Yeah, and so this, I think, was the point at which it was um, it made sense in the comic to talk about the research, you know, to talk about the different kinds of research that had been done on the dike, point up so Fox's work, point up, uh, point up CPAT's work, but also in the um, panel that we're not talking about, the location that we're not talking about, show how this monument was landscaped away so that it survives here because it wasn't part of the landscaping work that took place immediately around the house and therefore wasn't bulldozed. So there's, there were sort of two threads of two threads of the story, of the Erdig story, that we worked into the comics panels here. And it was nice, I think, in the um, Cyril Fox and CPAT one to also show the sort of superimposition of time. So you had uh, Cyril Fox and CPAT in the same panel, showing how that archaeological work has, the, or the thread of archaeological work has continued, but obviously it's with different equipment, different media, people are dressed differently, and so on. And so you get a sense that the, the working story is as much part of the Watts Dyke story as the Watts Dyke story is. Yes, and ongoing research on Watts Dyke is all about um, understanding a monument that survives in fragments, but where some of the best results are going to come out from places where it no longer is visible, where it looks like it's almost obliterated. And that's what CPAD have been able to achieve. So we come to the end of the Watts Watts Dyke Wrexham Comic Heritage Trail and we've taken you on nine uh, stopping points on our journey from the north of Wrexham around the western outskirts and into the Erdig Estate and we want to finish here on the Erdig Estate because this is where the long distance uh, walking path the Watts Dyke Way heads out south where you can follow Watts Dyke all the way from Middle Sontley down to Rowaban and then you can pick it up and follow it all the way to Oswestry Street, to Old Oswestry Street Hill Fort, and then into the town of Oswestry Street and beyond. And so really we wanted to just say this is part of an ongoing story. Watts Dyke goes over 63 kilometres from the D estuary right the way down to um, uh, the, uh, the Morder Brook, which then feeds into the Vanwy and then to the Severn. And on that journey it takes on and adapts to very different landscapes and topographies and also to rural countryside and also to townscape and that's what we wanted to capture in our heritage comic trail. And it, I think it's also um, worth noting that a lot of people won't experience Watts Dyke as anything other than a walking trail, anything mm. other than a, a kind of a day out or a destination, you know, something to do. And, and that, I think, is one of those parts of archaeological outreach that we often forget. We often forget that not everybody goes to an archaeological monument to experience the archaeological monument. They often go there to experience the walk or the or the wildlife and so on. So yes, the, the, the panel kind of captures that a bit. Yeah, and it's to remind you that, you know, you don't have to be a long distance walker. You can be on a, on, on a short little afternoon, go for a little trundle along a path and you may just notice a bit of this early medieval earthwork and think maybe about the stories that we can learn about not only the early Middle Ages, but all the generations of people living in this landscape from before then, from back in prehistory, through the Roman period, through the early Middle Ages, right up to our contemporary world. And it's so important because we want these monuments to be not only a part of our landscape, but a part of the landscape for future generations. And if people don't know they're even there, then how can they respect them, understand about them, learn about them and engage with them? So we want to thank you for joining us on this little trail um, and you can of course go and uh, link in the descriptions below will take you to um, the Offers Dyke Journal where all the academic research can be found but also to the Offers Dyke Collaboratory WordPress blog and to the website where we will have um, all of these panels and the links between them so that you can explore um, Watts Dyke and learn out about what Watts Dyke is. For relaxing times, make it Archeodeath time.